My name is Zaim Billa. I'm the current PGY5 integrated VIR resident here at Kaiser Permanente. And today we'll be talking about tips for VIR residency. And so the first thing I have to mention, right, in order to be a successful VIR resident, you have to know that this field is going to be the right thing for you, right? There's a lot of medical students on this call um, who are interested in clinical VIR, which I think is great. But one of the things that we've seen since VIR has become an integrated pathway is that there is some attrition. There's people switching from integrated VIR to diagnostic radiology because VIR isn't really exactly what it was sold to them as, and they realize that it actually isn't the right thing for them. And so I think the first step that you need to take as a medical student is figuring out if this is the right residency for you. So I have a list of questions that I really think any applicant should ask themselves prior to getting themselves into this field. First, do you want to be an endovascular and interventional surgeon who provides good clinical care for patients? And I, I mentioned surgeon because our lifestyle is the lifestyle of a surgical resident and surgical attending, right? I have many friends who are also PGY5s uh, here at Kaiser who were my co-interns during my surgery year. And there will be many times where I get to the hospital earlier than them and I leave later than them because it's the same lifestyle. And I highlight clinical because it's a patient facing specialty. You want to be excited about taking care of patients. And are you gonna be excited about these things? If you're not, then maybe this isn't the right field for you. Do you wanna use imaging and geography and endoscopy to provide elegant, minimally invasive solutions to reduce recovery time, perioperative morbidity and mortality? That was what really got me initially excited about the field was how minimally invasive and how elegant it is and how well these patients can do after you operate on them. Are you gonna get an adrenaline rush from waking up at 2 a.m. to embolize a patient who's actively bleeding and you're the only one available with the skills to save them? Because I promise you throughout your career, this is gonna to happen to you multiple times. Are you just gonna be upset over the lost sleep or you're, are you gonna get an adrenaline rush by saying, oh, hey, I'm the person that can see this patient? Are you looking for a fast paced environment where you're caring for some of the sickest patients in the hospital, these ICU patients who really are an extremis? Are you going to be able to handle those situations? And do you want to develop a deep understanding of diseases in the body from head to toe and be able to operate on multiple different systems? Are you looking for a broad scope of practice? If the answer to all these questions is yes, then maybe this is the right thing for you. Now, don't go in, into VIR if you're looking for any of these things. And I mention them because this is kind of what the specialty was branded to me as by multiple different people when I was an M3, M4 uh, medical student. It was even branded to me as this from other specialties when I told them I was interested in the field. Don't go into this field if you're looking for surgery light, looking for doing cool procedures with a good lifestyle and great work-life balance, right? Because, you know, the work-life balance is going way more towards a surgical lifestyle in this field. And so if you're looking for that, then you may get disappointed and you may get burnt out and you may switch to another specialty. Don't go into this field if you want to do procedures without the quote-unquote pain of seeing patients in clinic and rounding on the floors because, you know, you've seen this from multiple attendings who gave presentations throughout this conference that in order to be a good vascular and interventional physician, you need to be seeing patients in clinic in consultation and follow up and taking good care of them. You can't just do the procedure and leave the patient to be out on the streets on their own. That's not good medicine. And don't go into this field if you want a good salary. There's way easier ways to make money. Um, and you're just going to get burnt out if you're not really passionate about what we do. Now, that being said, Let's go into what makes a good VIR resident. And this is things I look for as a chief at my program. This is things I look for in my juniors, right? Number one, you have to be highly self-motivated. You have to have this get it done mentality of something needs to be done for this patient. I'm just going to go get it done myself, right? Um, and a lot of that is built during a surgical intern year. You may not be like this at baseline, but it's a skill that you can develop during a busy surgical intern year. And I think of medicine as split into, you know, two broad categories. You have your doers, which is the more surgical subtypes. And then you have your thinkers, which is more of the medicine, the people who around and really actively think about their patients 
uh, for a long time to figure out what's going on. And I think that there's room for both in medicine. We need both types. And it's not like one is better than the other, but I think that you need to have some introspection and think of which one of these are you. If you're more of a doer, a more of a surgical subtype, then maybe this field is the right choice for you. You need to be someone who goes above and beyond for their patients. And many people, people will mention the mom test. If this was your mom's doctor, how would you want their doctor to be taking care of your mom? And so you need to be someone who thinks about that and is the type of person that you'd want taking care of your mom. You need to be comfortable and calm in a fast paced, often chaotic environment. There will be a ton of really active patients who are bleeding or clotting, who are um, septic, who are actively trying to code on your table. And if you're losing your cool and you're the team leader in your operative suite, then you can be sure that anyone else who's part of the team is also losing their cool. So you have to be a calm, cool, collected North Star as the team leader, um, as the operating physician uh, who's taking care of the patient. Um, another three characteristics, which are good for, you know, all residents and all programs to have, you need to be teachable, you need to be able to implement feedback, take constructive criticism well, don't get defensive or shut down when someone's trying to help you improve, be a good listener, be professional, be on time and reliable. Importantly, you know, you need to be humble, um, being overconfident can lead to poor patient outcomes and you can really hurt some patients if you're overconfident, especially as an operating physician. And lastly, I think being curious goes a long way. Asking why a lot. Um, why did this patient end up on my table? Why didn't we just go with medical therapy? Why does this patient even have this disease? Keep asking why over and over again until you are satisfied that you kind of understand what's going on. Now, what is VIR residency like? Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this analogy or heard this analogy throughout your training at various different points. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. There's just tons of information. Um, you need to be really good at anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, imaging, clinical knowledge, pharmacology, microbiology, technical skills. And it is really a Herculean task to get good at all of these things. So when you're a PGY-1 or a PGY-2, or even a sub-I as an M4, you might be looking at this path like, oh my God, this is never ending. How am I gonna get to a point where I feel confident taking care of patients? And so this is really how I felt as a PGY-2. Like I, the PGY-6 during my year as a PGY-2 was an absolute beast. And I was looking over and I was like, how am I even gonna get started on getting to that level? right? And so the answer is like, you just put your head down and you take it step by step. And you realize that this is the team sport, you'll have seniors, you'll have co residents, who are going to help you get there along the way. And so, you know, it's, it's much, it's very much akin to this picture that I have here is like PGY one or two, you're just learning how to climb in the first place, you're just learning the lingo, the language, the anatomy, PGY three and four, you're starting to get those things down and you're starting to actually put those things to use and get uh, good learning in. PGY five and six, you're uh, filling in any holes in the knowledge that you have. And importantly, as a PGY five and six, you'll see that there's this string that you're holding and trying to pull your juniors up to where you are. And then as an attending, hopefully you're at the top of the hill, but I put a question mark here because all of my attendings tell me you come out as an attending and you realize there's an even more steep learning curve at that point and you're really never done climbing, right? Um, and it's just a never ending quest for knowledge and learning how to take good care of patients. So let's get into the training pathway. I know that Jonas had a slide on this before me, um, but this is the old quote unquote integrated IR training pathway that really was what was the beginning of integrated IR, which was when I first graduated medical school, right? And that was, it was pretty separated. It wasn't really that integrated. And so starting M1 in two years, um, as Marvi and Satya were mentioning, you're learning your foundational basic sciences, biochemistry, anatomy, pathophys, pathology, microbiology, basically basic sciences, right? And then you switch over to clinical medicine starting your M3 year, pharmacology, physiology, taking a good history and physical, which takes years to develop, years and years. 
on how to even ask a question in the way that you'll get the right answer from the patient that you're looking for. How to develop a broad differential diagnosis. How to use tests like labs and imaging to help you get to a diagnosis and choose the right treatment path. That stuff is very hard and you don't even get really good at it by the end of your intern year, to be honest, but you develop a good foundation. But then in this old quote unquote integrated pathway, you'd switch gears completely to diagnostic radiology. You'd forget about clinical medicine for three years and you'd focus on anatomy, pathophysiology and physics and imaging. And then all of a sudden you go back to a PGY-5, go back to clinical medicine and be expected to relearn the clinical skills and all the differential diagnosis and all of that, and then be a good surgeon within two years. And, you know, I think a lot of training programs are looking at this old pathway and seeing it as inefficient, right? Why are you losing all of those clinical skills during your two, three, four years? And so you saw this in the program director panel yesterday a lot of different programs are on the same page saying that we need to integrate clinical medicine into our training. And we need to do it in those PGY two through four danger years where you're hemorrhaging clinical knowledge. And so a lot of more forward thinking programs now are focusing on maintaining and building upon that clinical foundation during those two through four years. And how are we doing that? Rotating through clinical rotations, ICU and CCU, participating in VIR clinic, during those diagnostic years, adding more VIR rotations during those years and taking more VIR call during those years. And then that way, when you're a PGY five or a six and you're focusing on learning to be a good surgeon, you're just building on that big foundation that you've developed now over six years rather than just three years and then lose three years and then try to regain it. So I think that's important to look for in a residency program. So let's talk about how to succeed during those diagnostic years, because, you know, diagnostic radiology is still a big part of our training paradigm at this time, and you need to be really good at it. Um, and so how do you get good at it? There's a lot, a lot of self-study involved. And so I've listed a few resources that I've used personally in my training. E-Anatomy is fantastic. You know, it is a paid subscription, but I definitely think it's worth the money. And they really label for you all structures on every slice in all three planes. Core radiology is like the first aid of radiology. It's great when you're a PGY two or three learning the basics. Radiographics is great for delving deep into uh, specific disease processes. Rad primer is a good question bank. Stat DX is great when you're on call. I like YouTube a lot uh, because diagnostic radiology is a visual field. And I think that you need visual resources to learn it. So I would literally just have attendings going through their search pattern on YouTube on my side monitor while I scroll through a study and I'll develop my search pattern that way. And then I'm a big believer in Anki, but I think it's the closest thing to downloading information straight into your brain with space repetition, but everybody has their own process. So flashcards aren't for everyone, but I, I encourage everyone to choose one way to study and just go with that. Next, I think looking into patient charts is really important. What's going on with the patient? Why did they order this imaging study? How are you gonna read it in a way that adds value to the patient's care? And following up on that is if you made a read and sent a patient to the OR, what did they find in the OR? Were you right, were you wrong? Get some follow-up so that you know for next time whether you were right or wrong and you can tailor your reads that way. Reading volume, there's no replacement for reading volume. The more volume you read, the more cases you read, the more pathology you'll see, the better you'll get. It's like the most one-to-one -one relationship you can get um, when you're working in your diagnostic years. Asking lots of questions. The benefit of diagnostic radiology is that you get a lot of one-to-one -one time with attendings when you're reading out and they're a content expert and you're really learning. And so you, you get the time to ask them a lot of questions and pick their brains. Take cases in conference. Um, I think being very proactive and putting your head out and trying when you're taking cases in conference goes a long way. And not just conf like cases where you already know the answer the second you see the first image. Don't take those cases because you're not getting any value from that. Take cases where you actually don't know the answer and you can kind of struggle through it um, and test your thought process. And um, those will add much more value because when you're fumbling on a case in front of 30 of your co-residents, you'll remember that much better than you getting a case right that you could have answered in your sleep.
okay? And then lastly, running tumor boards, multidisciplinary tumor boards, I think there's a lot to learn from our colleagues in other specialties and seeing how the imaging plays into um, that each patient's care. So you can learn from your surgical colleagues, you can learn from pathologists, you can learn from oncologists, radonc, you know, a bunch of different specialties, um, and you can get a better global understanding of how the imaging plays into the patient's overall care. Now let's switch gears and talk about how to succeed on the interventional service, right? A lot of this is how is is similar to how to succeed on a surgical service because you know we are a surgical subspecialty. And the first thing, the key to success is patients first always, right? Any patient who's under your care, you need to take ownership of them. And like I said, the mom test, if your mom was in the hospital, how would you want her doctors to take care of her? And you need to use that as your internal compass of what you should be doing, right? If your mom was in the hospital and she had an intervention, what do you want her interventionalist to round on them daily? For me, the answer is yes. And that's why I do that for all of my patients. You know, you'll have times in your training where you're tired. It's like 9, 10 p.m. And you're like, oh, do I really need to see this patient postoperatively? Everything went well with the procedure. And I always think of like, if I was in the hospital, I would want whoever operated on me to check on me no matter how late it was. And then that's what gets me to not just leave the hospital and go home, go check on the patient real quick first and do the right thing. Next, be efficient and good at triaging. Jonas already you know, crushed this in his talk is making sure you have systems, checklists, dot phrases, smart phrases, whatever to make you efficient and being good at triaging. What can wait till tomorrow? What can wait a couple hours and what needs to happen right now? You need to be really good at trying to figure that out and having a constant um, triaging of your tasks at any moment in time. Um, that'll go a long way and that's developed during a busy surgical intern year. Next, you know, in the operative suite, you need to get your hands on early. And the way to get your hands on early is by anticipating in the OR. That is the single most beneficial thing that I started doing as a junior resident was when I started to anticipate the next steps and, and hand my senior what I thought they wanted next. Right. When I first started, I was super passive. Uh, I'll admit it. And I would just watch like my fellow um, do some of the complex cases. And, I, and my learning would be just typing the op note after, which is fine. But I think that what took it to the next level was when I when I tried to start anticipating the next step and handing them what I thought they needed next or calling for like a catheter or wire that I thought would benefit us. Um, or what we may need for the next steps. And oftentimes I was wrong. Actually, most of the time I was wrong. But by getting things wrong, you start to learn what, what you actually need. And just the active learning of doing that goes a long way. Um, and that's what I look for in my juniors and my medical students who are operating with me now. If they're starting to anticipate what I need next, then I'm more confident that they have a better understanding of what's going on. And I'm actually more likely to let them do things. If I see that they know what the next step is, then I'll just let them do it. Um, next, go to clinic and see consults on the floors. Being on the interventional service is not just operating and pre-upping the next patient and then operating again and getting into that cycle. Break it by going up to the floor, seeing some consults, making some decisions that'll get patients on your table or make some decisions where you're saying, oh, I may not be uh, the right thing for this patient and they may need something else. Um, and lastly, learn how to practice build and communicate as a resident. Um, close the loop with whoever sent the patient to you and build a practice. You can get referrals as a resident. Um, how do you maintain clinical skills during your diagnostic years? There's a lot of solutions that we've had personally at Kaiser, attending VIR clinic during your diagnostic years, having VIR conference, taking VIR call during your diagnostic years. One thing I think that anyone can do at any program is studying the clinical information about things they diagnose on imaging. So for example, you know, diverticulitis is bread and butter radiology, right? And so don't just stop when you're reading and say impression, acute uncomplicated diverticulitis, next case, right? Take the time to actually learn about the disease process. Learn about the Hinchy classification. Learn about what are the indications for surgery or drainage. 
if they go to surgery, what does the surgery entail? What's a Hartman's procedure? What can you do to prevent this from happening going forward? What's the data on fiber? If a patient does get a Hartman's procedure, what, how often is their ostomy reversed? Do they need a colonoscopy? How many of these have malignancy um, underlying the diverticulitis? There's so much to learn. You don't just stop at the imaging. Next, study the disease-based guidelines that other specialties are developing. Don't just study the procedure-based guidelines. Don't just study the PAE guidelines, right? Study the AUA guidelines on BPH with LUTs, right? That goes a long way. And that's something that I'm doing currently. I'm getting a lot of value from. And lastly, my last slide, I'll go over the golden question is what to do if my program isn't as clinical. Don't just take your program for what it is. I think that residents have more power than they think they have. And I think that you can fight to change the culture to be the type of doctor that you wanna be. Don't just take the program and be like, oh, they're not clinical. I guess I'm just not gonna get the training. We've had multiple meetings with people from programs across the nation who are looking to make their programs more clinical. And we have helped them find tangible steps that they can take to make their program better um, as far as the clinical standpoint. And I think that if you get buy-in from your co-residents, your attendings will listen. Next, spend your own time to rotate with clinical services, right? Oftentimes on diagnostic radiology during your di diagnostic years, you may get in at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. to start your day, whereas other clinical services are starting their rounds at 6, 7 a.m. You can get up early a couple days out of the week or a couple days out of the month or go rotate with the clinical service and learn from their patients. You can take your own time to learn on your own. Go to multidisciplinary conferences around the nation and world, places like ICIT, Viva, Link, which are multidisciplinary. You'll have multiple different specialties coming, experts in their fields who are giving lectures on how they approach patients. You can learn a lot from those conferences and you can do a lot of networking at those conferences to learn from your friends. Call patients yourself to get your own follow-up. If your program it's not in their paradigm to follow up with patients in clinic. No one's stopping you from just calling the patient on your own and seeing how they're doing. Round on your own. If your program's not rounding on patients post-operatively or seeing consults on the floors, nothing's stopping you from going and doing it on your own, right? You can build your own clinical training on your own if you're not being provided with it from your residency program. And that's pretty much all I have. That'll conclude my presentation. Um, I'm excited to see so many students and residents here excited about clinical VIR. Here's my information. Please feel free to reach out anytime.